how you're getting ready, I guess, but this is being cool. I'm going to introduce you. Uh, so our next talk is uh, SGM based uh, BIM DA accelerators for sequence alignment. Uh, Luke is going to present this work. Uh, so, um, so Luke uh, holds a Master of Science in Computer, si uh, computer Science from the uh, Technical University of Berlin. Uh, Luke is a, a similar PhD research fellow at the University of Oslo, working at the similar high performance department. Uh, previously, he worked at Google and Kubernetes in cloud computing and now focuses on solving computational difficult problems that cannot be solved with com conventional hardware. Luke is working with the GraphCore IPU and Cerebras vapor scale engine to exercise sparse computations such as SPMV, graph, and Bitcoin algorithms. So, Luke, uh, you can take it away. Right. Um, thank you very much. Okay. Um, today, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, AI accelerators, uh, AI accelerators that are um, already available on the market and which we wanted to make a bit more um, broadly useful for, for different applications. So, let me try to lead with, with an example. Um, back in the days, GPU started off as a device. Well, purely for gamers. You could play computer games with them, but um, later on people found out that you can actually use them very well for different applications. So, for example, you can use them for scientific applications, uh, weather simulations, tasks that are very computationally uh, demanding, um, or machine learning. And nowadays, uh, as machine learning gets bigger, people start to build hardware that is really custom fit and custom tailored for machine learning. So, the domain and it's not um, computer games anymore, but the domain here is um, uh, machine learning workloads. And we wanted to figure out if we can retell the story going from a gaming device to scientific computation, but instead going from uh, machine learning to uh, other applications. Um, so specifically, we are in uh, HPC and we are interested in HPC workloads. So can we do something like weather simulations, um, uh, finite element methods, or can we do um, bioinformatics, which nowadays also become part of uh, HPC. Uh, um, so as an as uh, working uh, for machine learning workloads, and this architecture is an MIMD processor. So instead of using uh, SIMD and SIMT, uh, which GPUs use, uh, they use a lot of tiny individual cores, and they also spend a lot of their uh, silicon budget on. gives you a combined bandwidth of roughly uh, 52 terabytes a second. And when you want to communicate between these uh, individual cores, you can do this with an interconnect bandwidth of 8 terabytes a second. So this is really interesting uh, also for sequence alignment because it's uh, well, fundamentally limited by, uh, by the memory bandwidth. And we, so this is why we were really interested in this. So taking a further look on the graph core um, uh, on the IPU, um, you can see that all of, the, all of these uh, tiny tiles are connected through an exchange network. We cannot really say right now too much to this exchange network, but it uh, connects all of the tiles. This, this is enough for now. And uh, a single tile contains a core with six threads and 624 kilobytes of tile local memory. This is really important because you can only exchange data by communication. You cannot access um, uh, memory of a different tile. And you have one cycle to load and store values, so you can do 128-bit uh, load and 64-bit store, and there's no cache hierarchy because you only have this local memory available. Um, there also is um, external memory which you can use, however we will see uh, in, in the next slide that this is not really practical for us. In general, um, for, for single core, this uh, this architecture breaks down to um, uh, having two pipelines. You have an integer pipeline or the main pipeline, which is responsible for the control flow, and you have an auxiliary pipeline, which is responsible for floating point operations. 
Uh, and it's really uh, tailored to AI and ML workload. So we have this XP operation, which is, um, is, is difficult to use for other things when the dense matrix multiplies. Um, so the, the whole processor is, is a barrel processor that's time multiplex. Um, they don't give you any uh, synchronization methods, so there are no mutas, mutases or uh, atomic operations, which are really fast. So we, we see them more as individual threads, which kind of share um, a memory domain. And you can also see that to the main memory, there's this exchange connected. However, however the, there's no explicit API uh, exposed, and we have to use it through the software side in an implicit way. Um, in, in general, we can say that exchange can be done uh, from any tile to any tile. We're not really restricted by uh, the location here. So we can just send a smaller data packet from one tile to, to another tile. And uh, we, we only need to know um, a global ID. Um, and we can also send it to multiple tiles. So uh, broadcast, native broadcast operations are supported. And we can also do multiple communications from tile to multiple tiles uh, at the same time. So there can be multiple communication pairs uh, exchanging at the same time. Um, looking at the uh, memory bandwidth and at the memory uh, layout a bit more, um, we going from a tile local memory to, to the registers, we have these 54 terabytes a second. Um, and then going from tile to tile, uh, doing the exchanges, we have an aggregated bandwidth. So all of these are aggregated bandwidths over roughly 1,500 cores. We have an aggregated bandwidth of 8 terabytes. Um, and then when we go off chip uh, to the DRAM, we, it, it's quite slow. So this is why we try to avoid, this is roughly 6.6 6 uh, gigabytes a second, um, which is not really that much for um, for most use cases, so you'll have to uh, think, really think about when you uh, when you do this. Um, so communication cannot happen at the same time as uh, communication is happening. And for this, the hardware in hardware implements the implements a ESP pattern where you uh, separate compute exchange and then a global synchronization phase, and you group all of that into a super step. So this is like one unit you can schedule. It's one super step, and you do. Uh, uh, computations, exchanges, and then global synchronization to end this um, to end this super step, and this is really important because you, like this, you can avoid race conditions uh, very nicely. Also, all of the communication pairs and sites need to be known at compile time, so we cannot really do this dynamically. So that's also one thing we need to think about. On the software side, uh, programming this chip uh, follows. If, if you're familiar with machine learning workloads, uh, follows like. TensorFlow ish model, so you program your data graph where you have your states and you have your computes as vertices, <coughs> uh, where you have your computes as vertices. Mm. And then the state transitions from one state layer into another state layer. And you can do this over these vertices, which just compute something. Um, and then you group this into a super step, which in the end will introduce a global barrier. And after the super step is done, you know that the next state is completely well, uh, clean. So there's uh, nothing can write in the state anymore. And you can you know you can read without race conditions. So going from left to right, we have synchronization and we have adjacent uh, state and compute layers. Uh, and going up, adding more vertices adds parallelization. So each vertex is only uh, executed on the same tile, and oh, sorry, uh, is always executed on a single tile. So adding more vertices increases the parallelization, and you need to map to to make the communication work. You need to map everything uh, to a specific location. You need to map everything to a tile. So here, looking at your your tensors, you can subslice your tensors. And you can say that this subslice or a certain subslice lives on one tile. Uh, looking off, the, off at the top left tensor here, we say parts of this live on tile uh, T0 and parts of this is owned by tile T2. And then for the com computation phase, which happens on tile number three, we copy over the values that are required for T3. So we copy over the subslice of X and Y. And 
put it on uh, tile number three, then we do the uh, computation and then communicate it to the subslice that is on by tile number zero. Uh, it sounds quite uh, uh, inefficient, however, we have this eight terabytes a second uh, tile to tile interconnect, which makes this seem quite fast. So, uh, on the programming side, we can first define our, our tensors. We also have to give it uh, a location, but we don't. We omit this here for simplicity, and then we have to re reference uh, a kernel we have written in a different file. Uh, so this is the add kernel, and then we have to set uh, the location of this and connect the tensors to our vertex or to our computation. And then this is the code for the kernel. This is this will then be run on the IPU itself. The previous code was setup code, which is used to compile code for the IPU. And here we can see that we have our inputs A and B and score, and these will be moved by the, by the uh, compiler. So it generates exchange code for this, and we, we don't have to do this. Uh, and then at runtime, when this compute function is called, a and B are available, and score will be copied over after we exit out of this compute function. Yeah. So, looking at which algorithm we wanted to accelerate uh, for for sequence uh, for sequence alignment uh, use case, we had the choice of uh, heuristics or exact algorithms, and we chose the Swift Water implementations as it is uh, often found. Um, or versions of it are also uh, often found in. Uh, many real-world pipelines, and uh, a lot of research also has been done with this algorithm. So there are different ways of uh, using SIMD instructions to uh, speed up a Swift Waterman. There are different trade-offs trade you can choose uh, to make it more memory efficient, to make it um, uh, faster, um, and then there are also uh, s uh, specialized hardware implementations. So for our pipeline, we chose a many-to-many -many, um, protein clustering pipeline, um, where in the alignment step, uh, a lot of a lot of time uh, is spent uh, comparing many sequences to many sequences, and this uses Swift, uh, the Swift-Waterman algorithm, and we wanted to exchange this algorithm with uh, one of our implementations. So, uh, in general. Uh, about this Waterman algorithm, we can say that uh, we do not know the start and end positions, so sequences can be completely uh, aligned, uh, can, can be self-contained to each other, can only overlap at, at the end positions, and we uh, want to have uh, gap penalties, because, or a thin gap penalties, because um, one large gap is more likely than many uh, um, adjacent gaps. And we want to be able to use similarity matrices, which encode the likely, li likelihood that um, uh, certain amino acids, uh, or how likely it is that you can match up to uh, amino acids. So, looking at the Swift Waterman algorithm, we can see that it's quite regular. So, we build up a dynamic programming matrix, which you can see down here. And this dynamic programming matrix uses partial results that we previously computed to compute new results and then uh, give us our final result. Uh, here you can see an example. So to fill one cell, we need the top, top left and uh, left cell values and then we can fill, fill up the whole matrix and then get our final result. And one can also see here that this will grow in, um, in quadratic space. Um, sorry. So uh, for our implementation here, we chose um, uh, a column-wise implementation because we are uh, because uh, growing a large matrix uh, is, is very difficult if you only have uh, 624 kilobytes. Um, we used the columnar version of this algorithm. We didn't use the stripe support version because this is only really useful for SMD instructions, which we don't really have access to. And uh, in our implementation, we uh, took careful consideration of how we encode our data types so we can use the integer and floating point pipeline at the same time. So we can use this dual issuing two pipelines to make use of most of what the hardware uh, can offer. One thing is that we 
cap couldn't really go over uh, with this approach because robotomy mm -hmm. couldn't really go over certain sizes because uh, of n is still quite large and we also couldn't parallelize it most. So if we have one sequence which is really large because the runtime is always pretty close to uh, uh, the length of the A sequence times the length of the B sequence, this comparison uh, really can can cause problems for other ties because we have this global synchronization step and we, we have to wait. So we also introduced a, a small load balancing uh, step which is similar to K partitioning um, uh, which we saw heuristically uh, to then balance the, the workload. Um, and, and this worked quite well. So uh, on pastas compared to, to uh, a modern Xeon, we could see a five, five times speed up of the overall pipeline. And we could also see only in the alignment step, which is the only thing we changed, we could see an 11 times speed up. Uh, compared to the GPU implementation, we could see a 20, 24.9 speed up in the GPU kernel. Uh, one thing to note is that CPUs are still quite fast for this workload. Um, this is why we, um, this is why CPU and uh, GPU implementations are, are actually quite close for this. Um, and for one uh, IPU to one GPU implementation, we had a speed of 2.8x. And we could also see that uh, adding more IPUs generally helps. However, at some point, our partitioning or uh, preparation of the data uh, be becomes uh, becomes a problem. And uh, the, the data set we could run for this pipeline wasn't also large enough so that we could uh, do uh, long, like, very good, strong scaling in this case because the, the data, like we, we, we solved it in a, in a second and then the preparation just uh, took too much time. Um, so the, the paper on this is currently in review, but it contains uh, more in-depth results. Um, you can look at this slide later. Um, contains more in-depth results, uh, looks at uh, more specific uh, uh, CPU and GPU implementation, which we compare us to as uh, weak and strong scaling results and also discusses different load uh, balancing algorithms. The second thing we try to do, because at a certain point, uh, this, um, this predictive runtime really is a problem, especially for very large sequences, is uh, to, to reduce the search space and to make the computations we do um, um, more, well, let's say, meaningful. So what, what you can do is you can either restrict the search space uh, statically uh, with the bandit implementation, or you can use a heuristic called XDROP, which tries to uh, focus more on the uh, more uh, tries to focus more on the value uh, paths, which are um, uh, which probably leads to a good result. So this is a heuristic, but uh, it's still quite close to the support implementations. And um, a key challenge here was that the, the memory requirements are in ON. But I mean, ON sounds good. However, when you have sequences that are very large and you have six threads, so you need to have a uh, uh, scratch space for this algorithm three times times six. Uh, we run out of memory very, very fast, um, and we can't really run this on an IPU. So the one thing we had to overcome was the memory requirement. And what we did for this is we, op uh, we saw that in this extra algorithm, it is possible, uh, so, so when it, it sorry, um, what you can see in this extra algorithm is that you have a valid search space or a space in this matrix which you actually operate on, which is the gray area here. And in this gray area, only there you do computations and you, you take your results from and you write into it. So what we can do is we can actually restrict the memory we allocate to only use this uh, certain search space. And for, uh, for, for the reward data sets we tested and for synthetic data sets, we could see that we had a 55x reduction in the, in the memory usage compared to what previous algorithms used. And this made it possible to run it on the, on the IPU, on the tiles, and we could see uh, good speed ups, uh, even compared to, to uh, state-of-the-art Milan processor. We could see a 4.1x speed up on, uh, to, compared to SIG1, which is quite, uh, quite challenging. 
And we have also tested it on a uh, de novo long read assembly pipeline uh, using the HiFi data set. And we again had tested it on PASTIS for uh, protein sequences. So this is uh, a quite general implementation. Um, the final work uh, contains more results. It also gives um, a, a further optimization which uh, helps with many many sequence alignments to reduce the amount of data we actually have to send to the IPU because sending data is quite slow and this uh, reduces the, the amount of data we send by three to four x. So in the end, uh, I wanted to say that it's quite possible um, to use and, and beneficial to use these new AI accelerators for uh, for sequence alignment workloads, but there are some things that need to change to really make this hardware useful. And the, the biggest problem we encountered probably is the restriction on the BSP pattern, which we believe can be weakened at some point, but uh, it currently is the, the main obstacle we, we need to overcome when programming for the IPU and managing the, the amount of available data. So you have to know before runtime how much memory you want to allocate. So in a, in a sense, you do your own memory allocation. So you have a memory area. You, know, you, you give it in the beginning of the um, of, of the compilation, and then you have this memory available. And you have to for so for for, for this uh, optimization here, you have to you have to choose a um, a, a certain size which will be uh, equal or larger than the, the longest width of, of this area you compute. Um, but it usually is quite small, um, which we have tested in Perkin. Okay, so, okay, I can, See that, that you need to allocate the total capacity, but also how do you allocate the individual rows that can change in size? I think that's the other issue I have in mind. The different rows. Um, I, I, sorry, I mean. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not like a nice regular cable at this point, right? So, it's not a two dimensional, yeah. it's not a, like just a two dimensional array that you index into. Uh, uh, yes, it, it's not. Uh, we do, so we have um, a certain size array for, for this, so on, on the lower part of the memory registered version, we, we, we allocate uh, in memory or only, only um, an array of this length, and then we do a lot of address translation to always shift the searchable area in, inside, of, inside of this array. So, uh, you can see here, we, as a fixed point for, for this computation, we, we chose uh, the lower end um, of, of the enter diagonal, and we always fix it um, to, to this part uh, of, of the search space, and can only grow, uh, in each iteration, it can only grow by one. Uh, so, we know if we set, offset it by one, have, have it uh, in a fixed space uh, allocated, 
and then through some address tra translation, we, we always try to shift the view of the memory um, around so that we, uh, so, so, it, so it, it doesn't look like it is, yeah. I think it, I can kind of see that person like when it has. Okay, look, uh, I another question with your permission. Yeah. Leonid. So, uh, I mean, first of all, that's, that's, that's very interesting. I mean, uh, using IPU for this kind of application, that's uh, inspiring. So, but my question is more general. I mean, how does it compare in terms of performance with GPU, for example? Because, you know, for me, uh, I'm just, you know, looking at the commercial angle, obviously IPU must be very expensive solutions. So, just interesting, I mean, if you can share any results. So it, it really depends also on, on the data, um, uh, on the data you have. So well, you know, 30x human genome standard thing. Yeah. So we focused on this many-to-many uh, -many sequence alignment on and on the novo pipelines. We cannot do mapping well at the moment. Um, so to, to the so so to the overall performance, uh, it's it probably would be best to to look at the more in depth analysis. Um, you can write me an email. Our our work is currently uh, in submission, but I could right. send you a manuscript. Um, in the beginning of the talk, there uh, there was my email. Uh, just drop me a mail. I can uh, send you the manuscript and uh, if, uh, yeah. Right, okay, thank you. Thanks, thanks again, and let's congratulate Luca again. Thank you.